Hello friends, welcome to Smart News Digital. Today, let's see the current affairs of August 21st, 2018. The first news article we are going to see today is with respect to Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, Stay with RCEP. The negotiations with respect to RCEP with 16 Asian nations are going on currently and it has reached a very decisive phase after years of efforts. RCEP it consists of 10 Asian nations and plus 6 other nations which are called as Asian plus 6, they together form RCEP partnership. These 16 nations are Australia, Brunei, Cambodia, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, New Zealand, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam. And if this RCEP is signed, this will be a very substantive agreement and it will benefit multiple countries in the partnership. And so Singapore is conducting the negotiations of RCEP forward currently. So as we all know, India is a very important part of RCEP. Going ahead with RCEP or coming out of RCEP, both will have multiple implications on our country India. Let's see what will be the implications on our country. India has certain concerns with this RCEP in its form right now. So it is asking for some other amendments in order to proceed further. Let's see what are these amendments and the negotiations currently happening. First one is India fears the China factor. If RCEP is signed, there is a fear that the Chinese goods will flood Indian market and Indian market will have massive trade deficit with respect to China. India already has a huge trade deficit with respect to China and if RCEP is proceeded, this trade deficit is expected to increase multifold. In order to come out of the situation, India has proposed the amendment to the RCEP partnership. This uh, amendment is called as differentiated market access. Under this differentiated market access, India need not sign free trade agreement with respect to China, but it can make some amendments in order to benefit its own country and the market in its own country. Under this differential market access program, India need not go ahead and sign FTA with China as proposed in RCEP. And in this way, it will benefit the exporters and the other consumers in our country and it will also protect the trade deficit of India. So if this differential market access is implemented, it will definitely protect the sellers from India and it will thus does not increase the trade deficit with respect to China. It is also to be noted that there was a summit between India and China held in Wuhan. It is fondly called as Wuhan Summit. And in that Wuhan Summit, both India and China made significant progress with respect to addressing the issue of trade deficit. And China even agreed to increase the access of Indian pharmaceutical goods and agricultural products into the Chinese market in order to tackle the trade deficit issue. The second issue is with respect to the lower custom duties. So this RCEP proposes to reduce the custom duties with respect to the nations who are part of this RCEP partnership. So if so, the duties are reduced, again multiple countries good will come into our country and this will be a threat to Indian market. And the next issue India has with respect to RCEP is with respect to the services. Many countries like Singapore and Australia are not willing to accommodate India's demand to liberalize the services. If services are liberalized, then there will be increased mobility of Indian workers to other country. And this increased mobility is seen as a threat by some countries like Singapore and Australia. So they are not willing to go ahead with the services agreement within RCEP, which India wants. So it is seen that India has both positives and negatives with respect to RCEP in its current form. RCEP will definitely be beneficial to India if the limitations with respect to RCEP are addressed. So, India must involve with further negotiations with other countries of the partnership and go ahead to implement the agreement for to create a win-win situation. The second issue we are going to see today is also with respect to the international relations of India. BIMSTEC envoys bad for free trade agreement. So, the BIMSTEC stands for Bay of Bengal Initiative of Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. 
This BIMSTEC consists of seven countries, namely Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Thailand. BIMSTEC is often seen as an alternative to SARC. In SARC, Pakistan is an important member and because of the existence of Pakistan and its uh, feud with India for several years, the many important initiatives of SARCs are not implemented. So this BIMSTEC is seen as alternative to SARC so as to implement many development measures in the South Asian area without Pakistan. Currently, a BIMSTEC invoice meet is happening in Kathmandu and Indian Prime Minister is planning to meet other Prime Minister of BIMSTEC nations in Kathmandu around August 30 and 31st. This bilateral talk is seen to enhance the relations of considerably slow progress seen by BIMSTEC for several years. Among the important issues which are to be discussed in the meet, one important issue is the free trade agreement which has been standing in line without implementation for past decade. If this free trade agreement is implemented between these seven countries, it will definitely boost the intra-regional trade. The intra-regional trade between these seven countries are very low currently at around 7% and if this FTA is signed, the trade will increase to about 21%, that is threefold increase. The institution of BIMSTEC also suffers from lack of visibility. When compared to other international organizations like ASEAN, SARC, SASCC, etc., BIMSTEC is not as visible as them. So, there needs to be increased progress and negotiations in order to increase the visibility via other measures. This visibility issue of BIMSTEC is very important in the context of the negotiations going on with respect to RCEP which we saw right now. If RCEP is signed, it will further reduce the visibility and importance of BIMSTEC. So, the BIMSTEC nations need to put in efforts in order to sign the free trade agreement as soon as possible. And other issues which are to be discussed in the August 30 meet are Number 1 is terrorism. And in order to curb this terrorism, cooperation among the member states is highly essential, which can be established via this BIMSTEC organization. Another important issue with respect to BIMSTEC is the proposed Myanmar-Thailand-India trilateral highway. This highway is not yet completed for a couple of years and it is very much essential to increase the connectivity between the BIMSTEC nations. The third issue we are going to see today is rup rupee recovers against dollars. Rupee has touched the 70 rupees mark with respect to dollar. Indian benchmark equity indices like Sensex and Nifty has touched a new height because of the strengthening of rupee. And this strengthening of rupee can be mainly attributed to three main factors. The first factor is the increase in the investor sentiments. This is because of the increasing positive trend seen in many Asian markets including Indonesia, Taiwan and South Korea. The second reason is the recovery of rupee against dollar. As I said before, rupee has touched 70 rupee mark against dollar, which is also a reason for increasing performance of the equity indices in our country. And third is politics looks more stable currently when compared to previous year, which saw demonetization and other reforms like GST. These trends show positive developments with respect to the functioning of Indian economy. The fourth issue we are going to see today is with respect to the floods in state of Kerala. The union government has announced that the floods in the state of Kerala as a calamity of severe nature. So let's see what is calamity of severe nature. First let's see about the classification of disasters in terms of calamity. What are the classifications of disaster and how does this affect the funding that the states receives? So, according to National Disaster Management Policy, the only the state governments have to provide funding to the disasters in case of the relief work. And this funding is provided in the form of State Disaster Response Funds and only in the case of calamity of severe nature, the central government will come in and provide assistance from the National Disaster Response Fund. So there are two funds, one is State Disaster Response Fund and the other is National Disaster Response Fund. Only for the calamities of severe nature, the National Disaster Response Fund will also aid the state fund. However, one must note that there is no specific law or rule 
for the government to designate a calamity as calamity of national importance. So, designating a calamity as calamity of national importance is discretion of the central government. How are the National Disaster Response Fund and the State Disaster Response Fund are funded? So, the National Disaster Response Fund, it gets most of its money from a contingent duty that is levied. So, this contingent duty is mainly levied on certain items like pan masala, chewing tobacco, cigarettes and as well as other budgetary provisions as and when needed. And apart from the budgetary provisions and the duty, the provision also exists for any individual to encourage and contribute to this National Disaster Response Fund. However, this National Disaster Response Fund is also criticized for not tapped the potential so far. With the implementation of the GST regime, there was more transformation brought in. But in spite of the GST's new reforms, government is still following the National Calamity Contingent Duty method to collect funds. So, this SDRF corpus is contributed by the union and the respective state government in the ratio of 75 to 25 with respect to normal states. And in case of special category states such as hilly states and the states in national borders, the contribution is in the ratio of 90 is to 10. And this allocation of SDRF to each state is done by the Finance Commission and the center contributes to the specified state as requested by the finance commission. So, this allocation of fund of SDRF will be given by the center to the state as specified by the finance commission. And this funds from the center to the state, usually they will be given in two installments, one in June, other in December. So, what are the recent trends in allocation of the NDRF funds to various states? So, in the year 2017 and 18 alone, up to December 2017, the center has released this NDRF fund to 9 states. These are the 9 states. And the center has also released the funds for other specific calamities with respect to Chennai floods in 2015, as well as the Vadra cyclone relief in 2016. The fifth article we are going to see today is with respect to climate change, educating people about climate change. So, we all know what climate change is and the climate change has high potential to disturb and reshape all our life. And so, this is a very alarming situation for everybody. And United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and United Nations Sustainable Development Report in the year 2018, it reports that climate change is one among the key factors in causing increased hunger and human displacement in different parts of the world. Another report by World Health Organization, it estimates that climate change will cause almost 2,50,000 deaths per year between 2030 and 2050. And this increased deaths will be due to increasing malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea and increased heat stress which will be caused by the climate change. And it is also to be noted that the climate change will affect the low income groups and the underdeveloped and low developing nations in a, to a higher extent. So, this developing nation also includes India which will be affected to a greater extent due to the climate change. The World Bank it projects that due to the climate change, India could lose up to 2.8% of its GDP and, and it could also diminish the living standard of people who are living in our country. So, the state government as well as the central government, they have taken several efforts in order to spread awareness about the problem of climate change. So, let's see some of the awareness programs taken by the center as well as state. In the year 1991, the Supreme Court came forward and it directed all the states as well as the central government to provide compulsory environmental education to all the students who are studying both in schools as well as colleges. And this directive of the Supreme Court was reiterated in the year 2003 in the famous case of MC Mehta vs Union of India. Apart from the initiatives taken by state government, central government and the Supreme Court, the corporate organizations, other educational institutes, NGOs as well as other foundations, they have come forward and committed themselves 
to educate people regarding the climate change issue. They have also provided know-how for mitigation, adaptation and resilience building to cope up with the climate change. These initiatives of the government as well as the civil society, they are targeted both towards the urban and the rural population including the school children. So in that way, it was considered to be inclusive. A special trust was given to key areas such as environmental sustainability. People were taught how to utilize changes in food, water and nutrition which will have positive effects on their own health as well as on the climate change. However, we have to note that despite the efforts by the government as well as the civil society, the change which we see in day-to-day -day life with respect to climate change is very low. So, this shows further awareness is required and further work is required in order to educate people towards climate change. So, it is to be known that India is still a developing country and a significant section of India's population is still living under below poverty line. So, the country's most of the plan is targeting towards these vulnerable population and it is contributing towards schemes for poverty alleviation, improving their living standards, enhancing education, sanitation, healthcare and other human rights. So, the concentration given to the climate change programs are very less when compared to the other welfare schemes in India. And second issue is that because of the higher population of our country, significant number of people are under the risk of climate change. And another factor is that this significant amount of people, they are not aware of the fact that they are actually under the harmful effects of climate change. So, state must increase the efforts in order to increase the awareness among this session of people. This article also proposes two innovative methods in order to spread the awareness about the climate change. The first method is with respect to Companies Act 2013. This uh, Schedule 7 of Companies Act 2013, it talks about corporate social responsibility. But this corporate social responsibility, it does not include climate change exclusively as a part of it. So, the article suggests that there needs to be an amendment brought into the Schedule 7 to include climate change. And such an amendment must include all the factors which are responsible for climate change, including ecological balance, flora, fauna, agroforestry, conservation of natural resources, including soil, air and water, to include and mitigate the effects of the climate change. And another innovative method proposed by this article is with respect to the role of the film industry. So by these measures, the corporate can become more responsible and contribute a significant amount from their pocket towards prevention of the harmful effects of the climate change. And another innovative method proposed by this article is by use of the film industry. Everyone in our country and all around the world are influenced by the role played by the celebrities. So this can be taken as a positive effect and special films can be made to show the aspects of climate change and important plays can be bought in to cover both adults and children including the games. So the film industry can incorporate special elements of climate change in their films. Writers can introduce climate change in their literature which must cover both adults as well as children. And with the increase in the digital revolution and the children's addicted to games, the gaming companies can take this as an important step and develop new games to support and educate children with respect to the climate change. And as it is very difficult to predict climate change, the issue of climate change becomes even more important and significant. And to address this crisis, government must take sufficient and urgent steps to protect its own people. The sixth article is with respect to the digital revolution and the penetration of the mobile technology. Southern states outshine rest of India in mobile banking adoption. So this is a report according to Boston Consultancy Group. The Boston Consultancy Group conducted this survey and proposed the report with the help of FICCI and Indian Banks Association. So the report found that Southern states, they perform better when compared to northern states in mobile banking adoption. So the, the pioneers in this mobile penetration are Telangana which is at 10% followed by Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Puducherry and Tamil Nadu. 
the average of these states are very high when compared to the national average which is very low at 3.4 percent the last issue we are going to see today is with respect to swachh bharat abhiyan the swachh bharat abhiyan was brought in by the government to introduce a clean india by 2019 so this 2019 also marks 150th birth anniversary of mahatma gandhi and government of india initiated a nationwide initiative in the name of Swachh Bharat. By using the Swachh Bharat initiative, the public can clean their public spaces voluntarily. They were not forced to clean their places, but it is only a voluntary initiative. In order to support this initiative, our Prime Minister as well as celebrities came forward and it was, the initiative was uh, promoted widespreadly using social media as well as television. However, this Swachh Bharat Abhyan, it suffers from certain limitations. The municipalities present in our country, they began to employ contractual labourers in order to clean the public places. And these contract labourers, they are mostly scavengers, they were forced to clean the public places to remove the waste. However, this Swachh Bharat Abhyan, it suffered from certain limitations. Number one is, the municipalities after the implementation of the Swachh Bharat Abhyan, they started employing contractual labourers in order to clean the public places. So these labourers, they were mostly scavengers and they were literally forced to clean the waste and remove the waste from the public places, which was kind of against their right to dignity. And the second dysfunction of the Swachh Bharat Abhyan is, it does not work on the underground sewage system, which is a problematic situation in our country. Recently, India has seen high number of cases of people dying after falling into manholes. And the statistics also shows that this manhole deaths are significantly high when compared to certain caste groups. So this shows a caste Swachh Bharat Abhyan link. And so this shows the link between the forced labour happening in our country and the caste group associated with the forced labour. Traditionally, for several years, there is a perception of purity and pollution attached to certain high caste and low caste and this is enhanced because of this Swachh Bharat Abhyan. The workers employed by the municipalities, they are forced to handle the waste, especially by their own hand and this causes a significant threat to their hygiene and affects their health. Toilets are also constructed outside the public places, especially like temples, uh, Delhi metro area, so that certain caste group can access the toilets without actually entering the main building. This also shows that the factor of purity and pollution is still present in the contemporary times. The stigma promoted by the concept of purity and pollution, it, go it touches areas of profession, labour, body and in the space too. So it is a multi-dimensional concept which needs to be stopped according to Article 17 which abolishes untouchability in our country. So any tangible improvement with respect to cleanliness in India can be achieved only when this caste nexus with the cleanliness is addressed. Thank you.